What's up, guys? It's Wick. Uh, here with second part for uh, March Bills. <clears throat> uh, I appreciate all you guys' feedback. I had some great feedback on the first video. I have not had anybody tell me it didn't work yet. Um, you know, it might be confirmation bias, but uh, I, I do appreciate everybody reaching out. Um, you know, just to let you guys know, uh, I make these videos for one reason, one reason only. I'm not the guy who wants to be famous. I'm the guy who wants to change the game. And if, you know, we're able to buck dogma and make changes to the game that makes it more competitive and makes gives an advantage to people who are in the know and understand it, that's everything that these videos are for. So um, I love you guys reach out. Uh, I love even more whenever you guys reach out with ideas of your own and want to talk about actually innovating. <clears throat> so, you know, I've got like five or six guys been with me since the beginning. Uh, Darth, one of my guys, he's, he's, been, he's been a baller from the beginning. I uh, love watching him just get better and better, his team getting better and better. Um, you guys have been uh, been great. So uh, one other piece of advice whenever you're watching these videos to get these things moving along. Um, I know they can be a little long. Just watch them at 1.5x or 1.75x. You can adjust the setting of how fast the playback speed is in the settings every time you watch a video. It will cut down on the time it takes and will get you through the whole video. So um, let's move on. Uh, this is where I want to start with some laughs. Uh, laughter. Uh, I saw this meme and immediately thought, man, that's me on the right. Uh, I've actually, ever since seeing this meme, I've actually wanted to get a, like a pair of clippers and actually do that. Um, but roughly the same build. Uh, I'm a, probably a lot less hairy. Do love beer. I love the outdoors. Um, that's the way I actually see the game. I'm definitely a big picture guy. Close enough, you know, see the uh, forest, not necessarily the trees. That, that guy on the left, that's Derek Defies. He's the guy who's precise, accurate, paying attention to every single detail. I wish I had the time to be able to get into the minutiae the way he does. I just don't. Um, unfortunately, I've got a very busy career that does take up a lot of my time. But I do love getting into concepts. I do love coming up with ideas. But I do love trying to change the game. So um, let's get to it. I'm just going to start straight off and warn you all. This is for my nerds, my fellow nerds, the pure nerds out there who are math heads. Um, you know, I got through Cal I, I was a human physiology major in college. Um, you know, pre-med, I used to take PhD level calculus just for fun. Um, and they used to really get pissed at me because I'd come in hungover and still crack the curve. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I was that guy. Um, so uh, this is for my fellow nerds. What I did here is I wanted to graph going over the, the filler layer versus main troop layer. And, and, and to look at this graph, which you see on the bottom of the X axis, you're looking at size and on the Y axis, you're looking at March effectiveness and the green curve is the size of the filler layers. And since they're both inverse, in other words, if you have 5 million troops, okay, if you take 1 million for your layers, you're left with 4 million for your March main troops. If you have 4 million in your filler layers, you're only going to have a million for your main troops. So I inverse the x-axis on the bottom so that the green was high on the right, low on the left. And <clears throat> the orange or the main troops is reversed. It's high on the left, low on the right, because again, they're inversed. So as one goes to the right, lower, they want to go higher. And what I did was I kind of graphed how effective the marches are, the effectiveness, right? So in the beginning, when your layers are really tiny, and on the left of the green graph, let's look at the green graph first. In the left, when your layers are really tiny, as they get bigger and bigger, your march effectiveness gets more effective with minimal impact on your main troop. Now, Right now, everybody's at about 1,000, which I would put roughly about above the letter I in the letter uh, in the word high on the, in the orange on the bottom left. And as you move right, you're going to see that the effectiveness goes up with minimal drop in effectiveness of the main troops. And the total effectiveness of your march is going to be the distance on the y-axis on that point of the graph. And if you'll notice, right around above the letter S in size, and where I have it, you know, blocked off with the black arrows on the top, that's going to be your golden area. That's going to be where you're going to get the most vertical axis from both graphs. And that's your sweet spot. Now, this is simplified, but it's helpful to understand that right now, everybody's living all the way on the left of that green curve. And I'm watching everybody slowly march to the right. And we're going to get to the point where people are running 30 and 50,000, 70,000 layers of other troops, not the main troop, of your filler layers. And you're going to see these massive hits and massive changes to the, that people that do this versus people that don't do this, are, it's going to be a game changer. 
it's going to be like the beginning days of the game when people were just hitting range and hitting mount and not layering. And I'm telling you, this is going to be one of those transformative changes, and I'm really excited for it. But this is a very simplified graph. And the true version of this graph, it wouldn't be green for all your filler layers. It, if this was an, let's just say this was a archer attack, an archer army, an archer PvP army you're building, green would be for grab, but there'd also be two other curves, one for siege, one for mount, right? And in fact, especially if you consider siege has that big difference in terms of range between T13 and 15 and so on, those other the batches of things, you'd have one color for T13 to 14 range, you'd have another color for T12 and 11. It gets so much more complicated, but it makes the game so much more customizable that I think that people's layers are going to become like their fingerprints. You're going to be able to tell what does this guy do and that guy do, and it's actually going to be able to offset advantages. If you know one person builds a bigger layer this way, you can actually offset it. and actually. So it becomes this cat and mouse game. It has a whole other dimension of the game. It's why I'm so excited about it. And I'm very curious to see as it becomes more mainstream what people do with it. So uh, that's coming. And right now, I can see everybody slowly marching up that green curve to where their march effectiveness becomes so much more uh, dangerous. So um, this is an attack, and I wanted to use this as an example. This is an attack during KE. I'm not going to, you know, I, and this is the thing I'm going to tell you right now. One of the reasons I left the Discord, the, the C4 Discord, is that every time I was on there trying to make a point about something, people, like, got fixated on something that had nothing to do with the point. And all of a sudden, they like would see one and two players would come after me, and ostensibly they were trying to have this gotcha aha moment. I know more than Wick, and that's not what I was there for. Uh, and it was mostly, and I realized it because I was, they, you know, a lot of them didn't know I was in RSP and on C1 and 2 Discord and in those, you know, WhatsApp chats, and watching them mock and laugh at how naive younger players were that they would gatekeep information or misinform them on purpose just to kind of trip them up, confuse them. And it, it was very frustrating for me. So, again, I just picked the two most recent battle reports um, in this video. So don't, you know, don't nitpick on that. These are all the illustrate points. This is me during KE. Um, there's a really weak keep. This guy, Nub, you know, he's a tiny, you know, keep. But he's being reigned by 9 million troops or 10 million troops. And um, it's not, it's me. I, 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 um, I see them raining. I'm assuming it's brown because that's what everybody likes to reinforce with. So I know I'm going to hit this keep with mount. Now I know I have an advantage because I'm the only K42 on my on my server, but I know that one of the keeps that is, is reinforcing them is an ex teammate of mine who's a K41, and uh, he's VIP 20. I think he's 24 now. I'm 23, so he's actually passed me now, and his tech actually passed me before I went K42. So he's a powerful guy and a heavy coiner, but if you look at the buffs, right, I mean, this is ridiculous, right? I'm way out overpowering them. But what I want to show you is this. And the point of sharing this is this. Here's my layer of my mount march, right? I've got the Napoleon. I've got Messina. I've got the buffs or whatever, blah, blah, blah. But look at my T15 ranged. Hitting a three reinforced keep with three decent players reinforcing a garbage keep. And if you look at my ranged layer. I've got a 20,000 range layer here, and it killed 400,000 troops. And it did, it never run out. It never, I'm sorry, excuse me, terrible English. It never ran out. It, it, it never died, right? It survived straight through, which makes sense if you're looking at your extrinsics, right? The mount is in the scrum. The range is in the back. It's, it's, getting, it's getting to kill with, with unrequited hits. And the 2188 most likely died from siege attack from the main keep or the siege layers of the other alliance, right? So, which is why a 20,000 layer was able to be so lethal. This is the kind of thinking I want to encourage and foster in you guys who are watching this video. What's going on in the battle? Who's where? And what the hell is making any sense out of this? This measly 20,000 T15 layers, layered crushed 400,000 troops. That, that should, if that doesn't tell you how effective a tiny layer can be, Right, it should tell you everything. And this is a video of the other player, 10 million power ground reinforcer, Aurelian Alessandra. If you guys know my choosing video generals video, you'll understand uh, why I wouldn't agree with this choice of generals. If you guys also look at his lair, that should tell you everything you need to know. 
His lairs did not play a battle, did not really play any function in this battle, right? And the other guys were not nothing to sneeze at either, right? Um, he's got a universal lair. Um, and the others, again, these are 7.4 million. These are respectable general strength. Um, and again, it's just, this is a layers game. Look at those layers, right? Look at the layers they're running here. So again, this game is, is about intelligence. Everybody as much as it is about spending. This is a, a player, uh, reached out to me, uh, you know, after watching the video, making changes in Battlefield last week, and wanted to share a report with me of how effective he thought it was. Uh, TJS for Flight on the left, Sky Alliance uh, sent me this, and he's playing against another guy. Now, don't look at the power of, you know, how big the keys are. You obviously the nuances of the battle, because this is a building versus building in Battlefield. Um, you look at a two-to-one exchange, roughly, where he loses uh, the guy on the right, uh, the guy uh, who he hit, is roughly losing twice, twice the power to guy on the left. And if you take a look at the March build, by the way, you do have a slight advantage of TJ having uh, March size over uh, Isitashkis. Um, and if you look at the generals, actually, TJ's got a disadvantage because his Pyrrhus isn't fully ascended. They're roughly looking at the same power. Scipio's got a Pyrrhus in, in the assist, and Lu Shun is assisting Pyrrhus on the left, right? So not, you know, it's, right now, so far, you're kind of going, okay, March size versus ascending, probably pretty close, right? Here you look at the buffs. If you take into consideration the debuffs and the importance of HP over everything else for a ground troop, it kind of almost even, right? The right guy on the right has a little bit of an advantage because his HP is going to be a couple hundred. Guy on the left catches up a little bit because his attack after the debuff calculations is a little different. But it's roughly a same battle. There is a sizable difference here that TJ has T15 ground, but what you should notice is that he's got a layer of roughly low, low 500,000s. They barely make an impact on the battle. They only kill 120,000. That's not where the difference was. Right? Look at T14 layer. Killed 1.79 million. And if you look at the other player, right? So I was one of the ways to look at these battle reports and I have been asked to do a battle report review. Uh, I feel like it's going to be a little boring for you guys. I'm eventually going to get to it, but it's not as crushing. But the way to read these in my mind, and the way I always do math in my head on looking at these battle reports, is to look at a kill ratio. How many players or how many enemies did the, each one of your guys who died kill? Right? If your ratio is less than one, if you're only killing half, you know, one player for every two of yours dying. You had a bad attack. That was a bad layer. That was a bad something disadvantage. If you're killing 10 to 1, that's a monster attack, right? So that's a big, big attack. Here, you're seeing a T14 layer of TJ on the left, right? So if you look at the T15 layer for TJ, which you some people say, well, he's got T15s, he only kills 120 and loses 500,000, right? He's at a negative kill ratio of that layer that everybody would say is a big advantage. Look at the T14 layer. 2 to 1 kill ratio. Look at the enemy player. That's a one to two and a half ratio. It's a very bad kill ratio. And his T13 ground layer just is, is, is pretty awful too. Look at the layers. The layers have barely any kills in them. They were wiped out immediately. Think of that graph I showed you in the beginning of how effective your army is going to be. If this guy goes up a little bit in his layers, he gets a couple extra turns in. You have a much better kill ratio. I will say this, TJ's got a great build here. He's pretty much on to a lot. Look at his ranged kill ratio, right? His T15 range here, he's got a 20 to 1 ratio. That's baller. That's awesome, right? And he's figured out, but he's got to build that out a little bit bigger. So that this is actually the kind of stuff in the testing and the thinking I really love to see other guys are watching my videos. I hate people who are just like, just tell me what number they are. Now. Go watch BK's videos. If you want me to just feed you the answers, I am not the YouTuber you want to watch. All right? I want to make it an exercise in actual intelligence and thinking. So here you go, right? You look at that. And, and let's segue here into back into the extrinsic world, right? Back, I think way back into one of my earliest videos, you're looking at extrinsics. You're looking at the way the battlefield is. And let's take a snapshot of mid-battle here. And imagine this is like your third or fourth turn. The troops have all moved out into the field. The speed has come into play. The, the 
Melee troops have met in the middle of the battlefield. There's a scrum. If you see me labeling it over there, I've tried to draw some pretty terrible JW stick figures here with the mounts and ground troops all over there. Um, and if you think of your, you know, war epic movies and the scenes with these troops in the middle, the melee troops and the horse and the mounted and the infantry all striking each other. Remember, what makes the melee troop a melee troop is that they have to be within arm's length of the distance, the length of a sword or a spear to kill each other. They have to be on top of each other. That's what makes a melee troop melee troop. You have to make physical contact. You have to be within arm's length. The archers have a 500 foot range, right? So they get to go they get to shoot from pretty far away, and they're not taking even any counter damage because the mount that they're killing isn't even within range of them. So they can't, they get these unrequited hits. So when you're, so first of all, the good way, the segue here is that looking at this should help you understand when you're building your archer lair, which layers do you want to have out? Right? It's going to help you determine which layers to fatten up. You have a finite number for your troop march and you have a finite number for your entire army so in other words if you have a finite number i'm going to tell you it's not going to be ten thousand layers straight up and down it should be fifteen thousand of one type five thousand of another maybe two thousand of one more that you drop it down a little bit and make the other one twenty two thousand these are the way that you're going to have to play with these numbers and then when you take away from the main march is the last really resort in terms of tweaking these numbers but it's very very easy if you sit down and think of which army you're building, and I'll talk about this at the end, um, how to determine what to build and where. In terms of this build here, right? So think of, so let's go to actually the main march. Let's pretend this is an archer um, hitting a keep, okay? And, and you're sending your archer army. Um, right now, I, if you notice, I built the T15 kind of bigger. 14 shrinks a little bit, 13 shrinks, and 12 is a little small guy. I'm trying to graphically visualize for you how powerful these keeps are, right? How, I mean, these are, these troops are. And that difference is I'm trying to build it in in the size. Now you have a T-15 troop and he's the biggest guy. He's got the biggest arrow. He's like a monster. Think of those guys in Avatar, right? Like these guys are real archers and they're shooting arrows, size of a spear, and they can kill anything. They get their turn, but T-14 goes right below them and T-13 goes right below them and T-12 gets over them. But these are all taking turns unrequited. You know, unreturned hits, right? The other thing that's very important to consider whenever you're talking extrinsics here is the knowledge that troops stop moving on the battlefield when another troop is in range. In other words, they're frozen here until the enemy's dead. So 15, 14, 13, 12 get to just fire away from outside of range, taking these hits, taking these shots. So if your 15, 14, 13, 12 get to go unrequited, you don't want... 15 to go huge, and then 14 to go half the strength, and 13 to go half the strength of that, and 12. So you're like looking at 50%, 25%, 12%. How do you make T12's turn be as powerful as T15's? So that you can wallop the enemy army with the same kind of force at that turn. Well, you get more of them, right? So you increase the number of the lower layers so that the unrequited hits are more impactful because you're multiplying the number of unrequited hits, right? Because in truth, this isn't quite accurate, but I, if I were really drawing accurate, I'd put some siege over there on the right with red, and they're raining down on the, on the range. So they're chewing away at your range, so you want to make the most out of every ranged turn. So you want to increase the number of secondary punches, right? Why hit somebody with one uppercut? When you can hit them with, and the, most, the most effective boxer is going to hit them with six jabs, three hooks, then the uppercut, right? It's the same concept, is if you can fit, uh, uh, fit in more punches per turn, your ranged troops become more effective. So here you have, again, what ends up happening, right? They're sitting there raining down arrows into that enemy army and taking no damage in return. So multiply the number of T12. So because of that, when you build your main army layers for an archer layer, generally I use the starting point, 10, 20, 30, 40, right? That equals 100% of your thing. After you've subtracted your percentages for your layers, right? You're going to go 0 0.2, 0 0.3% per layer. You're, you're going 10, 20, 30, 40 with the number that's left. And 
if you think about it, this is actually pretty close to the power differences per layer. It's not too far off. And you're going to get a very effective secondary, third, tertiary, and quaternary, quaternary punch, punch every single turn you have as opposed to one punch and then silence. So building up a heavier presence and a heavier number lower is better for ranged troop attacks. So here it is. 15, 14, 13, 12, 10, 20, 30, 40. This is the start. There's another iteration that some people like. That's 6.25, then 12.5, 25, and 50, which is very, very heavy T12, very, very light T15. This is advantageous for a couple of reasons. One, it's cheaper, right? And with just a little bit of loss of, of effectiveness. Um, second of all, um, in, ter in terms of... Uh, in um, battlefield uh whenever you you're able to kind of ratio and ra ra uh, ration your troops that way so that you're not pissing away all your t15s and by dropping the power by that much you're actually losing less power in the battlefield in other words whenever you lose you're only losing 350 million power per rally as opposed to 600 million 700 million for a ground rally and a mountain rally that's going to be reversed we're going to go over that right in, uh, in a second uh, this I wanted to show you again. This is don't get caught up or hung up into all the details and start looking at this. This is server war, just like two or three server wars ago. Uh, somebody drops their shield, uh, their bubble, uh, you know, and we all jump onto the enemy server to rally the guy. It's kind of a weak keep, 2.1 billion, poorly researched, poorly built. Um, and again, you know, we're way out, we're, we're, we're way out doing the person, but what I, that's not what a point of me showing you the support. What I want to show you the support for is this. My T15 range right there, okay? I have roughly 800, I think 780,000 here. Kills 17 million enemy troops. My 900,000 uh, of, of T14s kills 14 million, but, so it kills less, even though it's a bigger layer. And what I really want you to notice is how many were lost. Zero. Not one troop killed. Right? So what most likely happened here is uh, the siege probably took out my range up top. And the difference in kills might be that it wasn't just siege, might have been ground, and you get some counter damage. Why there's 17 million and 14 million down below. Because it definitely bucks the trend for the rest of the report. Uh, and, and again, it's also a more powerful troop, and the difference between 780 and, and, and 900,000 is kind of a small one, right? Um, I did up this number a little tiny bit before the attack, uh, just to be able to get a little more oomph into it, because it was several where I was worried they were going to bubble after one hit. Um, but let's take a look here, all right? And I want you to look at this next page of my report. So you saw T14 range, 900,000 killing 14 million. My T13 range of 1.345 million troops. No damage, none killed, none injured. Killed 27 million, 27.5. And when you get down to T12, look at that number. 2.2 million T12s killing 45 million troops. Now, remember, you're naturally supposed to seal natural increase, even if they were punching the same strength, which they weren't here. Because the T12s are going to be getting the leftovers, right? T15 is going to go first. It's going to be taking on the most powerful troops. And once you drop a layer, you're supposed to see. So T12s should be attacking the 13s and 12s after the 15s wiped out the upper layer. So that it's, it's hitting weaker troops. And that's one of the reasons why you're seeing the number. But again, the natural build and the natural numbers here are designed so that each layer hits with the same amount of force. Looking at mount, if you take a look at the mount melee um, troops, so it's mounted and ground, you have a scrum. There is no unrequited hits. You're in the middle of that, you know, war scene of just blood and guts and battle axes and Viking beards and armor and shields and everybody's killing each other. This is not the best time to make more numbers of your weaker troop. You want Achilles and Ajax and the Beasts and the Vikings out on that battlefield swinging battle axes, kicking everybody's ass, instead of, you know, Revenge of the Nerds, you know, Poindexter out there, you know, praying that he gets a hit in. So here you reverse it, 
And, and this is a nice visual I tried to put in there for to help you understand, right? These are melee troops. Nobody's killing anybody unless they're in arm's length of each other. They are on top of each other. So all the layers are hitting and killing simultaneously. Not unrequited, not outside of range. So the melee layers, you tend to reverse it. Um, there's different people going with different versions. I will say I've seen some people switching over right now to an 80% T15, 15% 14, and like 5% 13, which probably would get you a bigger kill ratio. But the one big problem with that is it's inefficient. It's wasteful. You're, you're pissing away a finite resource. Your troops are a finite resource unless you have, you know, uh, one of the black Amex cards and you can buy all the freaking coin you want and can buy all the speed ups you want. But for me, speed ups are a finite resource. So I could never do 80% T15s because I'd have two marches or three marches, I think. Yeah, mathematically, I'd have enough for three marches and I'd be done out of T15s and I'm healing. By dispersing it a little bit, especially considering that most of your hits in Battlefield are going to be a rally, I'm able to spread it out and get. 12 or 14 rallies out of my out of my army before I have to heal instead of three. So yes, may you may you want to change it up for going after something more powerful, a 20 billion keep or 30 billion keep, and maybe not hit it the same way you hit a four billion keep? Sure. But generally a stronger upper layer and a weaker lower layer is going to be much more advantageous for the melee troops. So my tips for you guys in terms of experimenting, sandboxing, and progressing with this is first of all you have to understand that extrinsics largely determines which layers are best with which with which marches you have to ask yourself which troops are advantage versus disadvantage and are you going to go with the philosophy of actually decreasing a disadvantage in other words do you want to make your mounted troops much more stronger against a ranged hit that you can hold or whenever you take a mount and attack a ground do you want it to be a bl absolute bloodbath where you lose like six million as opposed to 25 million or 200 million so you want to increase an advantage or decrease a disadvantage, but you can't generally going to have a tough time doing both. Which army type are you most likely to target with your march? Do you see a lot of people reinforcing with mount? Honestly, by the time that they're able to kill you with ground, that keeps done anyway, right? So uh, maybe range, but definitely siege and ground you're reinforcing with. Oh, and one little tidbit that I left out of this on purpose so that you guys who did stick with me and listen to this still do get one other thing out of this so important to understand that your reinforcing layer is not the same as your pvp layer you should understand that the optimal reinforcing layer is very different very different than what i just showed you and that is that you need that reinforcing army to be as powerful as possible with as thick layers as possible and you can be just as effective as a reinforcer sending just layers of a hundred thousand each as you can be uh, for, for some, for uh, particularly with these massive rallies, if you're sending tons and tons of reinforcements. Um, and if you want the optimal reinforcement army, essentially, if you're having somebody send siege or ground or mount, you want it to be as powerful as possible. So you are going to go the much heavier, heavier upper layers because that will, you have an advantage with debuff, you have an advantage with layers, you definitely want to take advantage with the most powerful troop. So, um, what army type are you most likely to target with your march? I mean, if you're sending, if you're, you know, tweaking out your ranged march, you're not thinking about, oh, what am I going to do to hit ground with? It's not going to help you, right? So you have to understand, um, think of what you're hitting with that troop and do yourself a favor and make incremental small changes to your filler layers. Do not make massive differences and then overshoot and then you end up shitting the bed for a week of all stars qualifiers. So be very thorough, be very um, uh, incremental. Have a plan. I'm going to go up by a thousand or two thousand or five thousand or seven thousand every week, depending on your march size, until I stop seeing improvement. Or if I overshoot it, I'll just back it off one week. Um, hopefully that gets you there. Hopefully that gets you there. Again, if you have any questions, uh, hopefully this helps clarify some stuff. Uh, I know uh, the one everybody's going to send right now. What about siege? I'm not telling you guys siege. I'm going to tell you guys to figure it out on your own for two reasons. One, I want you guys to do that exercise, and two. The most important thing about Siege, that you guys should understand, is that it is the only troop which range changes from tier. So the one thing I will tell you about Siege, if you're using T12s in your big, big Siege March, you're pissing those troops away. All right? 13, 14, 15, and 16 are the only ones that have the same uh, uh, range. Well, 15 and 16 are off by one, but 
um, you should understand that when you're building out your marches with that land, uh, with that troop type, that anything going below T13 is just foolishness. Yes, there is a purpose and a, and a, and a use for T11s and 12s, um, but again, it's going to take some time uh, for you guys to figure out those numbers. I'm still playing with it a little bit, but again, you guys should be able to re have listened to what I just told you. Hopefully, you guys can help figure out your siege on your own. Any of the questions, reach out. Uh, like I said, I always love hearing from you guys. Uh, what is that?